those on Facebook this morning that's with us. Remember, if you're in driving distance, it's worth coming out and being with us in person. And so, uh, come out and see us. We would appreciate that. A few things we do want to remember. 5 o'clock this evening uh, for uh, Facebook Live for the evening service. Uh, live from Sturgis, South Dakota. Pastor's out there ministering this week with uh, the Hellfighters. Uh, we're going to remember him in prayer in a little while. Uh, had a little bit of a mishap and uh, broke a little bone and put it in his uh, shoulder. So, uh, been a change of plans for him slightly. But uh, he's out there right now. And uh, we pray that uh, they'll have a fruitful week this week out there. Uh, we've got a few people gone this morning. Uh, Kathy and Steph are in uh, family camp in Clear Lake and uh, uh, different places, so uh, we want to remember each one of them. Uh, as we continue through the week, I do not want to forget Wednesday night. Uh, that's our prayer service. Please come and be with us. Uh, There's power in prayer. Mm -hmm. Our power is in prayer. Uh, we need to meet together mm -hmm. and uh, spend time uh, one with another before God in prayer with our mm -hmm. prayers and petitions. So come and see us Wednesday night. We appreciate seeing you out. I'm going to give you a couple minutes before uh, I pray here this morning so that we have an opportunity to uh, prepare our own hearts for the word this morning. I think it's important uh, anytime the word is given for us to have our hearts open and receptive to what God has for us. God did not intend for us to be here and not intend to speak to us this morning. So a couple minutes and then I'll open a prayer. Father, this morning, we want to thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your service. Father, may we never get to the point where we say this is the Sunday thing to come to church. Father, we're here this morning because we love you. We're here this morning because we want to worship you. You are worthy of our praise and our worship this morning. We want to praise you this morning for what you uh, do for us, answer to prayer. Father, may we always be uh, mindful of your presence in everything we do, day by day, minute by minute. Thank you, Father, for guiding, directing, giving wisdom and, and leadership in our lives. May we be open and receptive to what to have that. Father, as we do bow before you this morning, we have a few uh, prayer requests that we uh, lay before you this morning. Uh, we think of Peg as she's home uh, with a little bit of problem throughout the week. We ask that you'd help her, guide her. She's feeling better this morning, but we ask that you would continue to strengthen, continue to guide and direct. Edie's been sick last couple of days um, feeling better this morning but she's at home uh, recovering from that we pray for Edie that you give her strength get her back on her feet we thank you for what you've done in her life what you've uh, been doing and Lord we just ask that you continue to, to minister to her we thank you the pastor with the, uh, the, the problems that uh, he's facing at the moment uh, Father, we have pray for healing. We pray for uh, the continuation of this week and all that's going on. Protection is uh, what we pray for for uh, the group there and ask that you be guided and direct. Don's uh, daughter, as we hear this morning, has uh, got uh, COVID. Um, the area in which she works and things. Uh, Father, we just 
just ask that you just would uh, continue to heal um, and strengthen her body. Laura was here Wednesday night and mentioned that uh, the area that she works, they've got a few case, cases that have broken out. Father, we pray for healing upon the elderly, elderly there. We pray for those that work and deal with them and, and taking care of uh, these folk. Father, we ask for protection upon them. Ask that you guide and direct. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the rain this morning. We've been uh, an extended period of time, and uh, Father, we're appreciative of that. We thank you for that this morning. Ask that you speak to our hearts as the word is opened up, Lord. Ask that you cause us to be receptive to your word. This week ahead of us, there's not one of us knows the future. We need your direction. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We pray this in your precious name this morning. Amen. Amen. It is good to see you out. As we turn in our hymnals this morning, as we open up 285, revive us again. We praise the old God. We praise the old God.
to sing this morning. You may be seated. Pastor Jim. preaching church, maybe sitting in our homes because of uh, the <coughs> health issues that keeps us from getting out today. Again, Lord, we, you know where we are at, and uh, you know where we are at spiritually, and we want uh, your leading and guiding not only physically where we're at, but spiritually where we are at as well. Again, thank you for this church the Gospel Lighthouse and the community here. We thank you for his pastor and Cindy. We pray, Lord, your best upon them spiritually and, and especially pastor as he is out ministering today in South Dakota with his fellow writers. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, your will would be done in each situation that they're involved in. It would be the preaching of the word, sharing the gospel message with the lost. Just encouraging another brother in the Lord. Thank you, Father, for being with us today. Thanks again for the rain. And uh, we just ask your continuance in that area as well. Lord, we live in a wonderful country, not perfect, either are we. We live in a country that needs spiritual revival, revive us again. Lord, uh, we just pray that, that that could happen and we'd be a part of that. Thank you, Father, for the military personnel. It's in our country, it's in foreign lands, protecting our coasts, helping other people out. We just thank you for them. Now again, Lord, we quiet our hearts and minds. We surrender ourselves to the blessed Holy Spirit. Teach us from thy word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One day I was fishing. All right, many days I've been fishing. One day I was fishing years ago, and I was fishing on a dock, and uh, crappie fishing, and I had my crappie jig, and I was in front of the dock, actually the back of the dock, the dock that connected the land, and I was backing along there, and there were crappies galore underneath that dock, and I was backing up, and backing up, and backing up. I thought I had one more step. Gravity says, no, you don't. I took that step anyway, and in the drink I went. One small step, one bad decision, and I was in over my head. Okay, I know that's not very much, but there was 10 foot of water there, and in I went. One bad decision, one bad step, led to a whole bunch of bad consequences. Jonah chapter 2, please. Jonah chapter 2. Jonah, it's more than a fish story. It's a life story. It's more than just a, a little story that we can tell children and praise God for that. And it's more than just an allegory. This is a real life story of a real life man with a real life God. And as we studied from chapter 1, Jonah had some problems. See, when I backed off that dock, I created quite a predicament for myself. When Jonah did what he did in chapter 1, as we studied last time I was here, he created quite a Quite a, um, quite a predicament for himself from a series of bad decisions. I'll review my points quickly here from the first chapter. Why did Jonah get in such a mess? Why did he have such a problem? Because in number one, he disagreed with God. Matter of fact, he disagreed with the Word of God. 
Number two, then, that always leads to disobeying God. God says, Nineveh. Nineveh says, no. No. He distanced himself from God, went the opposite direction. He disrupted God's plan. God had plans for Nineveh. He had plans for Nineveh. He had a message for Nineveh. Then he said, no, not going there, not doing that. And he simply disregarded God's plan and God's response. He disregarded how God was going to respond. He didn't care. He didn't care how God was going to respond. Well, he's about to change his mind. Look at the last verse in Jonah chapter 1. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of this fish three days and three nights. That's quite a predicament. That's quite a predicament he created for himself and by himself. Well, he learned, as we need to be reminded as well, the decisions that we make, make the right decisions. There will be consequences. Amen. There are good consequences. If you make bad decisions, there's going to be bad consequences. And it's not only upon ourselves, but we also need to realize that no man's an island. Jonah was an island. He wasn't in it for himself here. And so there are three consequences we're going to look here. The three consequences of Jonah's predicament. Consequence number one, and we'll get to chapter two here in a minute in our reading, we'll pick up from there. But also, still continuing through chapter one, here's the first consequence of his predicament. Jonah forced others to do what they did not want to do. Jonah forced others to do what they did not want to do. They did not want to do that. And when we make decisions, bad decisions, we're forcing others to do what they don't want to do. And in this situation, Jonah forced God to, chapter 1, verse 4, send a storm. God didn't want to do that. And by the way, God didn't allow a storm. He sent a storm. Jonah forced God to do something that God didn't want to do, and he, and he forced God to send a storm. In verse 17, he forced God to prepare a fish. It's not like he didn't have anything else to do. You know, God's quite busy, and he can handle all the busyness, but sometimes he's got to do some things he just didn't want to do. God didn't want to prepare a fish for Jonah, but Jonah forced him to do that. Jonah forced God to send a storm. Jonah forced God to prepare a fish. In the last part of chapter 1, verse 17, Jonah forced God to chasten his wayward child. He forced God to discipline him. And God does not want to do that to you, to me, or to Jonah. He doesn't want to do that. Parents, you don't like, you don't enjoy disciplining your children. Grandparents, you don't enjoy, we don't like disciplining people. We don't like chastening people. Well, God doesn't either. God takes, takes no pleasure in, in the, the judgment of the wicked. He doesn't take any pleasure. Well, Jonah forced God to do those things. Jonah forced his shipmates, those on the ship with him, verse 5, to violate their conscience, excuse me, violate their common sense, verse 5 of chapter 1. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea. That goes against common sense. That just doesn't seem right to do that. Well, it didn't seem right to them. But because of Jonah's disagreement with God and getting into trouble with God, God forced, he really, God, God was forced to, okay, let me put it this way, scare the heebie-jeebies out of those sailors. I mean, these were sailors. This is a cargo ship, and they had goods on there, and they had a job to do. Their job was to get those car that cargo to a certain place so they, they would uh, get paid and they would get paid and they had families to live for and work for and they had lives to live. And yet Jonah forced these shipmates to violate their common sense, throw stuff away. 
that was good stuff. That just goes against common sense. Why would, they, why would anyone do that? Well, they were forced to. And in verses 11 through 13, they were, they were forced to go against their conscience. Verse 11 then said they unto him, Jonah, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea rod and was temptuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great temptest is upon us. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land. They did not want to do that. They did not want to throw another human being to his death. These were pagans that didn't even know God. But you know, they had a conscience. And they were, they were going to be forced to violate their own conscience and throw another human being to their own, his own death. I have a question underneath verse 12 of my Bible for Jonah. I bet you've asked this too. Jonah, why didn't you just jump in yourself? <laughs> why didn't you just jump over? Why force somebody to do something against their own conscience? Why didn't you just jump over? Because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And he knew God. I'll say it. See, Jonah forced others to do what he did not want to do. He forced God to do those things. He forced Jonah's shipmates to do those things. And Jonah forced his family to wonder and worry. In the first verse, his dad's name is mentioned. So he's got a dad. And a guy, well, let's assume he has a mother. He might even have a wife and children. We don't know. We don't know a lot about it. We don't need to know that. God wanted us to know that. He put it in there. If Jonah wanted us to know that, he would put him in there. But we do know he had, he had a family member still alive. He had a family and a son of Anakin. And he, think a little practically here. Hey, have you seen the, have you seen, anybody seen Jonah lately? You know, I've been downtown and we've been around and, and you know, Jonah, and he even went to the temple. Anybody seen Jonah? You know, I'm beginning to worry about my son. I don't know how many times as a pastor I've heard that scenario. Your pastor has too. You've heard it too. People come and say, I'm worried about my son. I'm worried about my daughter. I'm worried about, I'm worried about, I'm worried about this family member. I'm worried about them. I wonder where they are. I wonder where are they? I haven't seen them and what what are they doing? I had to Jonah. See, when he created his own predicament and the consequences of his predicament just didn't stay on his island. They went out and he forced God, he forced his shipmates, he forced his family to do things that they just didn't want to do. The truth is, Jonah had no considerations for others. God, fellow shipmates, his family, you know, and that's quite a predicament. Here's a little good note, though. One gentleman said this, God loved his poor, failing servant too well to permit him to prosper as he took his foolish and sinful course. God loved him. God loved him anyway. And he just wasn't going to let him go down that foolish course without responding. Consequence number one. Jonah forced others to do what they did not want to do. Consequence number two. Jonah found himself where he did not want to be. He found himself where he did not, he had no, he had no idea where he was going to end up other than if, if it all played out the way he had planned, he wouldn't be in Nineveh. But he had no idea where he was going to be. But he found himself where he did not want to be in the belly of the fish. Three days and three nights. Oh boy. 
Isn't that hard to imagine? Yeah. I have one old dear saint says, Pastor, you really believe that happened to him? Yep. Well, I don't know how that could. I don't either. But you know what I know? God. Mm -hmm. God. God can do things that we can't even imagine. God can create everything out of nothing. He can keep a man alive in a fish that he prepared. Otherwise, why would he prepare the fish if this wasn't going to happen? Why would that be in there? God would have been, would have been wasting his time. No, he had purpose for that fish. Or fish. He didn't have any choice in the matter either. But he was smarter than Jonah sometimes because he obeyed. But Jonah found himself in a place where he did not want to be in the belly of the fish. Okay, let's Let's stretch us a little further without getting too far. Let's use our sanctified imaginations. Let's get in with Jonah. And we have to imagine this, don't we? I don't believe anybody in here has been in the belly of a fish. We've had ourselves in some predicaments. Uh, and so I wouldn't want. But use your, use your five senses. The five senses that we have. Okay? Feel, smell, taste, hear, see. Now use your imagination, and here's Jonah inside this fish. What does it feel like in the belly of a fish? Ugh. Ooh. Mm. Chapter 2, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, he's got out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Sheol, the place of the departed, cried, and, uh, and uh, heard my voice. Verse 3, For thou hast cast me into the deep, and in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. What did it feel like for Jonah? Confinement. I don't know about you, but I, I don't, I'm not real claustrophobic. Well, I tell you what, if you weren't there, I wouldn't last very long in the My life, my wife wouldn't last out. She, she'd, been, she'd have been out of a heart attack and died on the way down the hatch. <laughs> she, she is, she's not real claustrophobic, but she don't like to be in tight places like that. Well, you know, this is a confining place. It closed me round about. It says, just closed me round about. And, and it's not a place to be, if you're claustrophobic, convulsions. He was inside a living creature. Okay? That fish was probably convulsed in the midst of the sea, in the belly of this fish, swimming around with stomach muscles contracting and expanding. This wasn't just an hour. It was three days or three nights, on and on and on. Convulsions, confinement, contamination from the, from the stuff that <clears throat> the fish had eaten on the way to get Jonah. And maybe the stuff that the fish was eating those three days. Um, ugh, ah, contamination. So we have we have a confinement, mm. convulsion, <laughs> contamination of all that. He could feel that. It's the picture of sin surrounding a person. All that confining and convulsing in the hearts and the minds and such a contaminant. That's what sin is. That's what sin makes you feel like. That's what sin makes others feel like. That's what he felt physically, perhaps. What did he smell? Hmm. Fishy. Something smells kind of fishy. That'd be an understatement. What? <laughs> Something smells kind of fishy. We've been to the Oregon coast when we went visited some pastor friends and they took us to the Oregon coast and, uh, and they took us along the coastline and over the one big edge is a long ways down, there were uh, uh, seals had gathered around in this one area. Why did that stink? <laughs> seals eat fish and fish go through. And that's, that's what it smelled, rotten, fishy, real stink. Strong, almost burned your eyes. Uh, the Oregon coast smelled like that in that specific area. Nauseating, putrefying, 
Every breath he took tasted kind of fishy. I love fish. We eat a lot of fish. But I don't like fish that well. That's a picture of sin. Sin is nauseating. Spiritually speaking, it's nauseating. It's putrefying. Mm -hmm. It's just downright sickening the more we think about it. Maybe if we get a little bit better picture of, of sin in our lives, we can kind of realize just how spiritually sickening it is. What do you taste? Well, there again, it depends what the fish have been eating. It also depends on uh, the stomach juices. See? That's been splashing around on Jonah for three days. He's splashing on his face and splashing on his lips and his mouth and everything he breathed. And it just was just all over. And it, it just tasted like sin. Sin leaves a horrible taste in your mouth. Oh, it might be pleasurable for a season. But it's going to leave a horrible taste in your mouth. Spiritually speaking especially. What did he hear? Dead silence. It kind of has, it, has a little effect on us, doesn't it? When all of a sudden there's a, there's a dead silence in the church. That's what he heard. Nothing. Maybe the heartbeat of the fish. Maybe the, the, the breathing of the fish. And the, they have air sacs. They have to breathe too. Every once in a while, maybe a big gulp. Well, there comes something else down. You know what he didn't hear? The word of the Lord. You didn't hear the word of the Lord. When you're out of God's will, you won't hear the word of the Lord. You didn't hear the word of the Lord. He didn't hear voices of fellow believers in the temple. He heard those voices singing songs of praise. He didn't hear the temple music. He didn't hear fellow believers. Because when, when sin gets you so wrapped up and confines and, and you don't hear other believers. You don't hear from God. You won't hear from other believers. They could be talking to you and counseling you and, and giving you all kinds of biblical advice in the scripture. But they don't hear that. Why? Because that's how sin works. Then hear the prayers of the saints. The church is a praying church. The prayers go out on the airways and everything else. I, I'm sorry, even if Jonah lived today and he's in the belly of that fish, he wouldn't hear those prayers. And that's what sin does. It's a picture of sin surrounding godly silence. And yet some pretty strange noises. When a person gets away from the Lord... They stop hearing the Lord. They stop hearing even the internal speaking of the Holy Spirit. They stop hearing that. But they hear a lot of... There's a lot of strange noises out there in our world. A lot of strange noises. Strange and in, 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 uh, contrary to the Word of God. There's a lot of strange voices out there. And that's what sin does. What did you see? Verse 3 says, The deep... Verse 5 says, the depth. What did he see? With no artificial light. What did he see? Nothing. Nothing at all. It's pitch black in there. For three days and three nights. When I say three long days and three long nights, he didn't see anything. Nothing at all. Total darkness. And that is a picture of sin. It will lead us into total spiritual darkness in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds. Well, our imagination has run wild, hasn't it? Mm. I'm not so sure it's too far, though. This is more than a story. This is an account. 
that God inspired to be written and put it in the book. Yep, it's what happened to Jonah. Quite a predicament Jonah created for himself. Jonah forced others to do what they did not want to do. Jonah found himself where he did not want to be. But then we see Jonah in chapter 2. Jonah finally did what he had to do. Matter of fact, Jonah did what was right. He did what was right. Verse 2, then Jonah prayed. <clears throat> then Jonah prayed. One gentleman said this, now Jonah realized how dire a thing it is to be apart from the presence of the Lord. You know, that's exactly what he wanted, wasn't it? That's exactly what he wanted. I'm distancing myself and he, from the presence of the Lord. Verse 3 says, For thou hast cast me into the depth and the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Did God throw him over? No. But God used to sailors to throw him over. But in the big picture, God says, or Jonah says, You know what, God, I see you working in this. You have me thrown over, Lord. And I said, I, cast out, uh, I am cast out of thy sight. Kind of like God saying, well, that's what you wanted. Now here you are. Deal with it. Be careful of what you want. God might give it to you. Be careful. When we're, in, when we're on a roll making bad decisions like Jonah was here, and he made a bad decision, God just said, okay, roll on, buddy. But then Jonah finally realized that, uh, hmm, For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about all thy billows, and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I, I am cast out of the sight. I'm, I'm out of sight. By the way, is that possible? No. But in his mind it was. Sure. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Ooh, now we're starting to see a turning point. A turning point's here in his life. The waters comes with me about even to the soul, fat deep. The death closed me around about. The weeds were wrapped about in my head. No oh boy, whatever. Yeah. I went to the bottom. So I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. Oceans have mountains, okay? And highs and lows. The earth with her bars was about me forever. It just seems like they went on forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O oh Lord my God. Is it a turning point in Jonah's life? You know when that turning point started? And one when he realized he messed up. And then he prayed. And he's get, he's, he was doing what he needed to do, get back in contact with God, get back on God's course. There he was in the middle there, down at the, the bottom. He had to reach the bottom. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, my head. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. That's confidence in praying. That's confidence in God. He had sunk to the bottom spiritually in his life, physically to the bottom of the ocean and the belly of that fish. He wanted to go down. He went down, 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 and ended up on the bottom. But there in the bottom, he started to come to his senses. And he started thinking about God. And God in the temple. Hmm. He's he kind of flashing back here. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercies. Now he's starting to look at himself, what he did, and what others do. These, these lying vanities, that, these things that are empty. Worthless. Is that believing and following them? You know what? They're forsaking the own mer the, the mercy that God will show to them along their way when He says, "Go to Nineveh. I'll be merciful to you, and I'll take care of you, and just keep going." But we walk out of the will of God, and, the, and you're just forsaking all the things that could be. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that. 
I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. He still had his confidence in salvation and the deliverance, the delivering ability of God. I will pay my vow. I'll, get, I'll go to Nineveh. I committed as a prophet years ago to you, and I committed myself and to pay the vows and whatever you want me to do, I'll do that. And I'll go to Nineveh. I'll, I'll, I'll pay that. I'll do that. And he could say that because he had confidence that the Lord, the Lord is the one who delivers, and salvation is of the Lord. Jonah finally did what was right. The turning point. Now Jonah realized how dire a thing it is to be apart from the presence of the Lord. The prayer points. Okay, there's a prayer in here. And now we've got some prayer points here I want you to kind of hang on to a little bit too. Number one, pray before the then. Okay, thank God for the thens. Verse the one of chapter two starts out with then. Then. Turning point. That's a turning point. Then. But pray before the then. Read chapter 1 over and over and over again. You know what's missing? Prayer. Jonah didn't pray. Jonah didn't pray about the decision that he was going to do. None of those decisions. Jonah didn't pray about whether, uh, what God wants him to do. He didn't pray at all in chapter 1. But chapter 2, then Jonah prayed. Pray before the thens in your life. Pray in the midst of then. Then is in chapter 2, there's something whole new going on here. Then he was in the belly of a fish. Then he was in quite a predicament. But pray in the middle anyway. No matter where you are. As I studied over this, what an odd place for a prayer meeting. In the belly of a fish. What an odd place. Perhaps you can come into your own mind where some very unique, maybe not odd at all, but very unique times where you prayed. And, and the Lord says, you need to pray. And, and the Spirit says, pray. And you prayed in a very unique situation, very unique circumstances, a very unique time. The first time I prayed was in a bunker with the bombs bursting in the air. That was the first time I ever prayed. That was a very unique prayer. A very unique prayer place. I'm not sure there's a, a more unique place in the Bible anyway to where a person prayed and in the belly of a slimy fish. And he'd been in there for three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. Mm, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? I think Jesus mentioned something about that. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the tomb. Why do I think this is a real story? Because Jesus used it as a reference about his own death, burial, and resurrection. If it wasn't a true story, why would he even mention this? If this was just a story, Rather than an account of it, then Jesus would have, would have been kind of misleading. Well, that was just a once upon a time thing. No, this is more than just a story. This is actually the truth. And Jesus verifies that. Because it's just a story. How much weight would that create? Uh, would he carry when he talked about his own resurrection? Pray before the then. Pray in the midst of the then. No matter where you are, whatever you've gotten yourself into whether good or bad, always pray. There's always time for prayer. And then thirdly, pray like you mean it. Some of our prayers, personal testimony, confession, some of our prayers, they're mechanical. They're just mechanical. They're just going through a list. And I, I, I understand why pastor has lists, and we have lists too, and I have... I have a, a prayer sheet uh, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and, and it's a list of all the people that attend Calvary Baptist Church in Green, where we go. And, and, and it's a list. It's a reminder, okay? It's a reminder who to pray for. And, uh, and on the top of every one of those, our pastor and his family are, 
first, right, because they're the first one. But sometimes even that <coughs> devotional time can become very, very mechanical. Be careful of that. But Jonah, Jonah wasn't, this wasn't a prayer of, uh, mechanically. This was a prayer from the heart. It was not for show. There was nobody else to watch. This was a real, real prayer. And it's not a prayer without knowledge of God. He prayed, and he knew he was praying to, and he knew what God would do. He says, uh, the salvation is of the Lord. He knew. See, Jonah's problem led to Jonah's predicament. And finally, Jonah prayed, and God pardoned. Jonah prayed, and God pardoned Jonah. Look at verse 10. Wasn't this an interesting thing? Verse 10. Here the Lord talking to the fish. I talk to the fish a lot. Come on, bite. Come on, bite. Well, this, uh, this fish paid attention to God said, and the Lord spoke unto uh, the fish and it vomited out Jonah on the dry land. Yeah. You know, it might, might seem like a lucky, not to Jonah. Because when he prayed, God was listening all along. He never did get away from the presence of the Lord. He just thought he did. But when Jonah prayed, God was listening. And Jonah, Jonah, all of a sudden, he, he was on the bank. The back of the bank. Why? Because God pardoned him. Well, I can't help but share Dr. Wearsby's outline in this. And I look at the commentary stuff after I've got my own. Dr. Wearsby put it this way in the book of Jonah in chapter 2. Jonah prayed for God's help, verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, Jonah accepted God's discipline. Verses 4 through 7, Jonah trusted God's promises. And verses 8 and 9, Jonah yielded to God's will. And God pardoned him. See, it's more than a, it's more than a fish story. It's a life story. Now here's the question. How's your life going? How's your life story going? I hope it's going smooth. Spiritually, that's what we want. But you know what? We all make bad decisions. One bad decision. And the law of gravity took over. And I ended up with quite a predicament. Fortunately, I know how to swim. Otherwise, I would not be speaking here today. I was out all by myself. And uh, but you know what? One that we all make bad decisions, but we don't have to stay in the consequences of those bad decisions. Why? Because we see God loved His poor, failing servant too well to permit him to prosper as he took his foolish, sinful course. And God could not let Jonah keep running. God could not let Jonah drown. John did not, or, uh, God did not let Jonah die a long, slow death from being digested. And God was not going to end the story in chapter 2. Why? Because God is merciful, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So what's your, how's your story going? Have you made the right choice today about God, about God's salvation, about God's restoring power? I guess the question would be, are you on the bank? Are you back on the dock? And the next time I'll speak, we'll probably go from there on that one too. But are you, are you even on the dock where the Savior is? How's your story going? Father, again, thank you. Lord, we realize that this is a real account, happened to a real man, because you're a real God. You don't have fairy tales in your book, you have personal accounts of people, and people of God as well. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves in the, in the opportunities that we need to do for you. We don't want to force your hand to do something you don't want to do or anybody else's. 
Lord, we, we just don't want to end up in a place where we wish we were not. And so we pray. We pray for your pardon. We pray for your deliverance. We pray for your strength. We pray for your mission that you have for each one of us. Help us in Jesus' name. Carol? Thank you this morning. As we prepare for our invitation, let's turn in our hymnals to 371, please. Have that on the way, standing with me, please. If you have a need, make it known that this morning.